Well, hello guys. Greetings and welcome to uh, a message of repentance series. We have a, a little bit more of a, a fuller house, not, not talking about the sitcom, uh, but we actually just have more people because a lot of our Time Revive Nations team is here along with some of our friends that have come in the neighborhood. Uh, this is our fourth lesson and uh, couldn't be more excited, but I can't believe we're still talking about repentance. You know, I'm going to keep saying this over and over again. We're going to do this for nine weeks. And uh, just when you think you got a grasp of it, you study more and you're like, oh, I never saw that before. Or, oh man, I've totally missed that component of it. And so, and then I even ordered a book from a a, a guy uh, that I have a great respect for. and, And I started digging into this and I was like, man, I haven't seen half of this stuff. And so I just think with time, my prayer is for each one of you guys, as we say this word repentance, as we talk about repent, that just there's another nugget that you can glean from, because then what, what are we looking for? We're looking to look more like Christ. That's, that's the end goal. And so hello to our friends uh, online. I see some American friends. I see some people here in Texas. Oh, there's a, a friend from Ghana, Africa. Uh, our friend Hubert, Brother Hubert Joel, uh, is on. I see Mike and Kay Ann Moore. Uh, they are our friends from Indiana, Nicole, uh, Sherry, just wanted to say hello. Sometimes, you know, you're living in your house and you're on your computer and you're like, hey, yeah, I'm distant. I mean, we see you, we hear, well, we don't actually see you, uh, but we recognize that you're online. I just want to say thank you for joining us. And if you don't know some of our team, uh, our team does a great job putting all this together, but it's just fun to call on them. Uh, is that we have Kevin McRavey. He prefers to be called the Kev, by the way. Uh, and don't you guys like his shirt today? <laughs> He just looks happy. He's trying to bring a happy message to repentance, apparently. So uh, hopefully we'll get to that point. We have Tom Jankowski. Tom is, Tom is excited. Okay, well, Tom, glad you're here. <laughs> Give us a nod. I say Dr. King. Hello, Dr. King. Uh, Theresa Bailey's here in studio. Dr. King's on from Nigeria. Good to see you, Dr. King. We've got Rich Goodwin in the back. Rich and Shelly, you guys want to say hello? Hello. Hello. Shelly says hello. I just, don't you guys love the dynamics of this? There's nowhere else that does it. We are as raw as they come. Um, that could be a good thing and a bad thing. But when you're talking about repentance, it's really probably a good thing. Uh, you know, our theme verse comes from Acts 26, 19, and 20. And if you'll go there, Kevin, Acts 26, 19, and 20. Hi, Robert. Glad you're here. Uh, Therefore, King Agrippa, this is the Apostle Paul, and he says, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Remember, he's on the, way, on the way to Damascus. He gets a download, right? And all of a sudden, he goes from Saul to Paul over the course of time. And what was he asked to do? He says, well, I wasn't disobedient to the heavenly vision. Instead, I preached to those in Damascus first and to those in Jerusalem. And then it says, in all the region of Judea and to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works worthy of repentance. You know, we do think of the word repent. We do think of people shouting at us. Do we not? Do you not think of that? We got to experience that just this last weekend in Chicago. We were coming down Michigan Avenue. This was just this last weekend. For those that are in the United States, we're in a state of uh, Illinois, a uh, large city, Chicago. And as we're driving down uh, Michigan Ave, I mean, Sylvan was there. Some of our team was there. Uh, it, it was insane, wasn't it, Sylvan? I mean, there were hundreds of teenagers running rampant, literally up and down the streets of Chicago. What we didn't know is there's cops everywhere, helicopters shining down a light. I mean, it was mass chaos. We didn't know at that time there was two shootings. Uh, one, people, one person that was in the car, just like us, sitting there, they came and got jumped. They smashed the car in. They, they hurt and abused the person. Like, it was just chaos. And you kind of felt like you're in the end times. I'm serious. And all of this was happening. There's a guy on the sidewalk shouting, repent. And you're like, that works now. You know what I mean? Like, in that chaotic situation, when lawlessness was just everywhere and rebellion was everywhere, the police, I don't even know if they knew what to do, to be honest. It was so bad. There was one young couple that actually got beat. One was black, one was white, and then another lady intervened. You guys, it was just chaos. And when I heard that guy yell the word repent, you're kind of like, yeah. Hell is breaking out in our own country. And I'm like, I actually agree with how he's doing it right now. Basically, we're trying to get the attention of people. Guys, we have to repent. And what are we talking about? Visually here, Laura and I talk about visuals. Repent is is you're looking at something and then you turn 180. You're turning. You're changing your mind. You're changing your thinking. You're turning to God. And according to Acts 
uh, 26, it says, repent, turn to God, and then do works worthy of repentance. That means that Chicago would stop the insanity of this lawlessness and radically turn to God, put the guns away, and begin to love on others, feed others, give them water, share the gospel, ways that would express Christ, and all of that stuff would stop. That's what we're talking about. That's what we need in our country, amen? We need that in Ghana, We need that in Nigeria. The reason that we started this whole series was because of Malawi. God gave me a simple dream and that the president, Lazarus Chekwera, called the whole nation to repent. And so our team wanted to get ready for a message of repentance for Malawi. So if we're saying that in Malawi, we got to get right. I don't know what the sins are in Malawi. I'm not claiming to say this is wrong, this is wrong. I just know God said we are asking for the men and women of God, not just in Malawi, but those that are listening to radically repent and turn to him, and yes, do works worthy of repentance. And so we've gone over the course of time, and remember in Romans 2, we talked about God's kindness is the essential foundation for all of this. God's kindness, because he spared us, because of moments like Chicago, let's just put it like that. God just says, you know what, I'm not going to wipe out everybody, but I, because of my kindness, I'm going to be patient with you, repent and turn to me. But remember, he did that with all of Israel. Sign after sign after sign after sign. God's kindness was leading to repentance. But the reality was is that the Israelites, according to Romans, they're not turning to him. There's a stubbornness. There's a hard heart. But yet God continues to show them, in my kindness, I just want you to repent and turn to me. And then last week, we started to get into the message of of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And you know, we we go to Matthew 4. This is Jesus' message. And I've always scratched my head because remember, he doesn't have the New Testament in his hand. He, he doesn't, he didn't have a wristband. What is he going to do? <laughs> the reality, he has a, one line, repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the Jewish people, and he says, look, I am right in your face. All of the prophetic things that you have heard about, everything that you have heard about, about being born in Bethlehem, all of these things, the prophesying, I'm going to be born of a, of a virgin, Mary. All of these things we walked through last week. Do you remember this? There are these signs, God's kindness. He kept showing them. He kept showing them, look, I'm giving you multiple signs. I am here. But why does he say I haven't come yet? Like the come near part. Kevin, what's the near part? Well, he hasn't fulfilled what he's come to do. He's standing on earth, but he hasn't died. He hasn't sacrificed. Right. So the part that's kind of weird, he's like, I've come near, but I haven't done everything I'm supposed to do yet. And that's what he's saying. He's like, look, I'm going to give you an opportunity right now to recognize who I am. But I also recognize I haven't done everything that I've been called to do. And so that's where we kind of landed last week is that I am here, but I haven't done everything yet. And so when we, when we plan kind of like our nine-week series, right, when we plan our outlines, I think all of us would say when we put Acts 3 as our fourth lesson, all of us were a little bit like, why is this after Matthew 4 text? Some of you might be like, well, what's the matter? Like, for me, you want to see it flow. You want to see your series flow. Building on this, here's what we're after. God's kindness now leads to this. Jesus affirms this and said, this is what I want. Repent. And now we go to Acts 3. And and so what I want to do is I want, if you guys would open up your word, or we're going to go to the scriptures as well up on your screen. Hello, Pastor Patrick Stephen, our good friend from Malawi. Uh, Glad you're on. Good to hear from you, brother. See you. We have our friends from Niger. Do you guys know where Niger is? Uh, good to have our friends from Niger, people from Richardson. I don't want to overlook Richardson and Minnesotans as well. Uh, but I want to go to Acts 3. We're going to attempt to cover 26 verses. We'll see. Uh, God totally took a radical turn for me just in the last hour, so we'll, we'll see. I'm just going to tell you the kind of a bigger picture. When we talk about repentance, uh, there's, there's four groups. That's probably eight, what I just did. Four groups. <laughs> Four groups. One is, it's, it's always for uh, the lost. The message of repentance is for a lost person that doesn't have faith in Jesus Christ. Repentance is also for born-again believers. Kevin, why is repentance for born-again believers? Because of the sin nature, the lost side, it's, it's something we have to do continually because right. we want to go back. That's right. So just so we're all on the same page, uh, I think this is important to know. I, I, don't, I haven't really written this out, but I think the... Uh, you know what? Sorry, I lost my pins. Kevin, where do I find my pins here? Plus? Nope. 
Anybody rich? Here we go. Thank you, Lord. Okay. Okay, so when we think about the word repent, uh, yeah, that word repent, I do think, right, it's for an individual that's lost, doesn't know the Lord. Number two, I think the word repent is for an individual that's saved, but it's an ongoing process, right? It's an ongoing process of letting the, the chaff burn away stuff. But then number three, okay, uh, I think it's for a, a nation. I think you're going to see scripture over and over again. He calls nations to turn to him. And I do think, this is kind of a weird statement, there's, there's nations that are radically lost, okay? And when I put number four up, it's a little weird. Kevin, maybe you can help me with this. I do believe that corporately you have nations that are safe. Don't, I, I'm not trying to preach anything like, but Kevin, what does that mean, do you think? I think there's nations. Uh, it talks about, back in Genesis, the promise that God gives to Abraham is tied to Israel, and they're saved in the sense that they bless them, yeah. and there's blessings that come back upon them. So I'm not going to get into all of this today, but I will just put sheep and goat on there. There's a sheep and a goat nations, okay? Theologically, we don't have time to unpack it, but I do want you to understand in this lesson today, there's individuals that need to repent that are lost, individuals that are saved that need to be ongoing and repent, and then you're going to see nations that are lost and that nations that are turning to him. Okay, if, I don't know if that's maybe a better phrase, you know, but Rich, are you there? I'm here. You want to jump in anything else with this ad on this, on the nation side of things? No, I think it's first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. So it's for both. Okay, good. You're going to see this in today's lesson. You're going to see all of it. And I want to go to Acts 3, verse 1. It just says this. Now, Peter and John, right? You've got buddies, right? They're, they're part of the discipleship crew. They're part of the 12, right? Peter and John, they were going up together to the temple, complex at the hour of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Typically, right, Jews, are, they pray how many times a day? Three, right? They typically would pray at the 9 a.m., third hour, 12 p.m., the sixth hour, and then they'd pray at the 3 p.m., the ninth hour. These guys were praying three times. Muslims today... They've been called to pray five times. And the favorite line of the day is, is, Christians are called to pray all the time. Right? Pray without ceasing. Like, this is the mentality. But interesting enough, in Acts 3, at this time, Kevin, there's a temple here. Correct. But Jesus has already been dead, buried, and come back alive. The temple's still here. The temple's there, but the veil's been torn. The veil has been torn. But what are Peter and John doing? They're praying. They're praying. And where are they praying? At the temple. <laughs> Does that bother anybody? It shouldn't. You are still Jewish and can still believe in Yeshua. Okay? I'm not going to get into all the dogmatic of different things, but when a Jewish person turns to Jesus, they don't stop being Jewish. It's important to hear this because by the end of the message, that's really, really important. So these guys, they're going to pray. I think that's awesome. These are men, the fishermen. None of us are too big for prayer, by the way. Oh, I'm not a prayer warrior. Peter and John are praying. You can pray. These are like hardcore fishermen, right? I think of Tony Hicks who's online. Tony loves to fish. Tony, I, I hear you on there. Tony loves to fish, and the reality is, is Tony should be praying too. All of us have this mentality, and my point is I see a, a, a Wendy or a Linda or a Teresa, like you guys have hearts to pray, and Peter and John, that's what they're doing. They're coming into the temple complex at the hour of prayer. And as they're coming in verse 2, a man who was lame from birth, he was carried there and placed every day at the temple gate called Beautiful. So he could beg from those entering the temple complex. Kevin, who's taking him to this gate? Whoever he can find. You got a lame man, a lame man meaning he's probably, he can't walk. I think this is an important note about this person. Watch this. You got a lame man from birth. Somebody's carrying him every day so that what? So that he could find some help. Can you imagine being a friend that you're always carrying somebody to the gate every day? That's your job. Right? That would be really, really like if it's my little boy Jude and I had to carry him. He's lighter. But you know, Joel, you and me, 
if you had to carry me and I had to carry you, we'd probably get tired of each other. Like, that's my point. Like, this is a lot of work. Bringing them to the gate. As they bring them to the gate, what is he doing? He's begging. He's begging, he said, from those entering the temple complex. He's asking for alms. You guys know what that word alms means? It's just like this charitable donation that they would want at this time. And we know that in Acts 4, thousands of people are coming and going. And here we have this great uh, picture here of the Temple Mount. So here you have people coming and going, you guys. This is the Temple Mount. Remember, the Temple Mount, okay, today, the Temple Mount is there. The Temple is no longer there right now in Jerusalem. What are the Jews waiting for? They're waiting for this to come back. Right now, the Dome of the Rock and Al-Aqsa Mosque, which are the Muslims, right, they have their holy sanctuaries on this place. Now, the Jordanians, they're the ones that oversee all of this. Isn't this crazy, you guys? You've got Muslims, right, that have their own place. Then on the wall, the western wall, the Jews worship this. And then you've got Jordanians that are overseeing all of it today. Like, it's just waiting for a whole lot of hot mess. Okay? I'd love to get into this, but we won't. But in the process, okay, what you have is, look what it says. Uh, every day at the temple gate, right here, verse uh, number 11 so every day, you've got a guy getting carried, and he's begging every person. You know, why, why wouldn't you go to a church environment, right, to ask for money? I mean, those are the people that should be generous, right? Those are the people like, oh, yeah, look, this is the guy. Interesting enough, as this continues to unfold, it says in verse 3, when he saw Peter, the lame man, and John about to enter the temple complex, he asked for help. I don't know, may, maybe, cardboard sign, Right? Right? I don't know if you're saying I'm working for food, but he's got something. He's got his go-to stuff. You guys know what I'm talking about. There are people everywhere like this. I'm not making fun of them. I'm not making light of them. They're a part of our culture. They're part of our environment. And it's interesting. In verse 4, Peter, along with John, he looked at him intently. And he said, look at us. Now, this lame man, when you hear somebody say, look at us, what do you think he's expecting? Yeah, he's going to give him some, uh, what is he giving him, Rich? What, what would he want? What's the Israeli money? Uh, he would want a shekel. Yeah, please, sir. May I have a shekel? I'm not sure why I just came out with that accent. And Peter just says, look at us. And the guy turned expecting to get something from them. And in verse 6, but Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold, but what I have I can give you. And here it is. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. I'm just going to tell you this. This is the, the American mindset of healing is that we are, I have no problem with this, but we put hands on people, Right? And it becomes a production, and it becomes sometimes a lot. Man, all Peter says is just one sentence. In the name of Jesus, get up, it's done, walk. Who doesn't want to function like that faith? Like me, I want to, and I pray probably every week for at least one person to get healed. And you know how many people I see get healed? Not very many. And here's what I want to tell you. Those that are watching online, even overseas, like if you're praying like this, don't stop. Don't stop. Just because you're not seeing it doesn't mean it's, it's not biblical. We see this all throughout Scripture. Matthew 10, he sent him out healing. Jesus' whole mission, teaching, healing, and, pre uh, and preaching. Like, this is what we're after. And so in all this, this guy, he says, get up and walk. In verse, verse 7, it says, and taking him by the right hand, he raised him up. And at once his feet and ankles became, and at once his feet and ankles became strong. I, I love what... Um, this is really quite crazy. Tom Constable, he kind of gave a physical description. Remember, the guy who's writing the book of Acts is who? It's Luke. He's a doctor. So he, I wonder if he wanted to put in a little bit more. Like, hey, by the way, the blood supply was now increased to the muscle. The brain then began to send signals to the nerve, ending at the ankles and the feet. The hardened fluid began to go between the joints were now softened. The muscles and the ligaments, they regained flexibility. And now all of a sudden, the feet that could no longer bear weight can now walk. All because it came in the name of Jesus. Like, I want to walk in that authority, don't we? Like, this is the posture that we're after, that the church needs to wake up to. We have the resurrected power inside of us. And because of this man... Look what it says in verse 8. He says he jumped up, stood, and then he started to walk. Can you imagine that first feeling? <laughs> I can't jump up. <laughs> he jumped up, he stood, and then he started to walk. And then can you imagine the swagger that he had? I'm the guy that's been waiting out here. I can walk. Like Jesus wants to bring healing to every person. And these guys were going to pray. 
It says he entered the temple complex with them. And then he says he was walking, leaping, and praising God. The lame man, maybe over 40 plus years. I don't know. Who knows how long he's been hanging out at the beautiful gate? By the way, this, this same mentality, the same uh, eastern gate mentality, he's coming back through this gate. The golden gate, my Messiah, your Messiah, he's coming back through the eastern. So I, I just feel like even that is a prophetic picture of us getting ready for more. And now here's the craziest thing. He's walking and leaping and praising God. And it says in verse 9, all the people that saw him doing these things, walking and praising God, they recognized that he was the lame guy, the one who used to sit and beg at the beautiful gate of the temple complex. So they were filled, watch this, with awe and astonishment at what had happened to him. You want to know why? Because they saw him over and over every day. Kevin. It's, it's the current day, like, S somber thought of church and all of a sudden somebody's making a commotion and legitimate commotion yeah it's a legitimate commotion shh, shh. right <laughs> i love this now watch this it says so when they are filled with awe and astonishment now here's the crazy part about all of acts three you're like what's this have to do with repentance don't worry i asked the same question <laughs> It does, it builds. In Acts 3, verse 11, it says, While he was holding on to Peter and John, all of the people greatly amazed. Possibly, we know in Acts 4, we know there were thousands of people there. Possibly thousands of people were amazed, and they, they ran toward them in what was called Solomon's Colonnade, the porch. Solomon's porch. Now, when you have an evangelistic outreach, I want to encourage everybody overseas, whatever country you're in, whatever state you're in, if you're here today, I want you to start praying for the lame man testimonies. Because what happens is if you see a lame man that's radically healed, radically saying, I am set free from my physical ailments, according to this, guess what happens? People are going to flock to this man. Like all of a sudden you have a testimony about what the power of Christ can do. And it says this in verse, and can you imagine that guy? Everybody's running at him. They normally flee from him. In verse 12, it says, when Peter saw this, he addressed the people. Here we go. This is where Peter begins to put on his preacher pants. And he says, men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Like, this is his opening line. This is, a, in my opinion, something that's not a good one-liner to start a sermon. <laughs> Probably something we would encourage each other. He says, what are you, what are you so, what are you caught off guard by? He says, men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Or why do you stare at us as though we had made him walk by our own power or godliness? In other words, he's already setting the stage. This has nothing to do with us. Why are you caught off guard? All of a sudden, I've now begun to go to Romans 2 in my head. God's kindness leads to repentance over and over again. I did this for you. Why are you surprised? I did this for you. Why are you surprised? I did this for you. Ten times we know this. He kept doing this to the Israelites. And every time, what were they doing? Uh, God, where's the water? God, why can't you split the Red Sea? God, why'd you bring me here? I need, I'm tired of this manna. And over and over again, and Peter plays the same card. Why are you surprised? Do you remember in Matthew 4, Jesus' words, repent? Go to Matthew 4, 17. We'll put it up on the screen here if we can. You guys can see this online as well. Matthew 4, 17, it's the same language. Jesus began to preach, repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. You should not be surprised any longer at what you see. Who's his audience? The Jews. Who's Peter's audience? Men of Israel, the Jews. You should not be surprised. He says, why do you stare at us? It's not like we did this. In verse 13, here we go. This is when he begins to turn the corner. This is why I think and I believe that God directed us to Acts 3 after Matthew 4. It's super bizarre to me. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. Man, let me just tell you this. If you are a Jew, that line right there is super offensive. These are the patriarchs of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And what does he just say? Kevin, who does he call out? What does he say the fathers are saying? They're, they're, are you ignoring God? <laughs> oh, you don't care about your forefathers? You don't care about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob? Because according to this, they have glorified his servant Jesus, whom, by the way, men of Israel, you handed over and denied in the presence of Pilate. You're the one who actually turned your back 
against our fathers. You see, in the presence of Pilate, Pilate had decided to release him, right, Kevin? Say that again. Pilate, Pontius Pilate, he decided to actually release Christ. Yeah, he said, I'm, I'm, I, I, won't, I don't find any fault, but if you do, it's your deal. So the government said, I don't want anything to do with Jesus, but the Jews said, oh, no, 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 we, we don't want him to be set free. So when you go into verse 14, it says, but you denied the Holy One and Righteous One. And you asked to have a murder given to you. Kevin, what's, what's this in reference to? Uh, Pilate, give them a choice if they wanted Barabbas to be released or, or Christ. And the people said, give us Barabbas. So Peter is reminding the Jews all of the things that they have been told. And all the things that they've been experiencing. It's exactly what Jesus was saying to the Israelites as well. But now the difference is, now he's going to begin into the death, burial, and resurrection. Last week we talked about, right, the prophetic words that the Israelites should know about the prophecy of Jesus being the vir- born of the virgin, all of the birth side of things. But now he's just saying, hey, by the way, all the prophetic things about the death, burial, and resurrection, you missed that too. Kevin, what were you going to add? I was going to say, it's maybe three, four months down the road from that taking place, so it's still fresh in these yeah. people's mind. Yeah, this is not like super like, oh, 100, 200 years later. No, he says in verse 15, you killed the source of life whom God raised from the dead. We're witnesses of this. You killed the source of life. Anybody ever referenced our Messiah as that? He's everything. You thought you put away the source of life, and God raised him, by the way, from the dead. And we're witnesses. It says in verse 16, by faith in his name, his name has made this man strong. Remember, the source of life has now been resurrected. They killed him. He's been come back to life. It's important because in verse 16, he says, now if you believe in the source of life, if you believe in the resurrected power of Christ, that's what made this man strong. That's what made this man walk and leap and praise the Lord. It is the power of Christ, nothing to do with Peter or John, fishermen, followers of Christ. It has everything to do with Christ. So that faith that comes through him has given this Watch this, perfect health in front of all of you. This is what our conversation was, team, wasn't this, yesterday? We were talking about when you pray for healing. Like, you know it's a healing when he's completely healed and it's done. A healing to me is when that situation is completely different. And he says, so the faith that comes through him has given this perfect health in front of all of you. Now, here we go in verse 17. It says, and now, brothers, I know that you, this is strange, I know you did this in ignorance, just as your leaders also did. Kevin, Rich, I kind of want to go there just for a second, okay, if we can. It just says, so I know you did this in ignorance. Any thoughts, Kevin, on what, what are, what do you mean in ignorance? Well, they didn't, they didn't recognize him as who, the, the Jewish people didn't recognize the Messiah as the source of life when he was standing on earth. And so he's saying, you didn't even know what you were doing uh, in the process uh, going through it. So basically what I hear is, is you have, you have deliberate sins, right? And then you have what? Sins of ignorance. This is important to understand the message for repentance today. You have deliberate sins, meaning you are willfully saying, heck, I'm going to go do this for this person. I had a conversation yesterday with a man of a different religion. It was insane. And he said that one of his leaders of his religion killed his daughter. This was a conversation we had two days ago outside of my, our apartment, our, our office. He said he killed his daughter because she was specially handicapped. And he said to my face, it was justified. Uh, that's a deliberate sin, okay? A sin of ignorance would be what? Rich, what, what would be a sin of ignorance? You got any thoughts? <laughs> yeah. So if I go into a store and I put like seven items in the cart, but I get to the checkout and I thought I scanned all seven, but I only scanned six and I just walk out. Maybe that's a 
Yeah, because that would be stealing. Because it would be stealing. you didn't mean to steal. And I didn't mean to. Well, I had that, all, every intention to pay for all seven items. That came real natural for you, Rich, on that example. I do it all the time. <laughs> oh Thank <my> you. <laughs> okay, so everybody understands the difference. This is important to understand, Acts 3. He says this, I know you did it in ignorance. So what is he saying it is, Kevin? He said, I know, men of Israel, I know you did this in ignorance. What is it? Killed the source of life. Oh, my gosh. How do you kill somebody, source of life, in ignorance? How do you do that? You don't know who he is, so what does it really mean, Kevin? What did they not know about the Torah and the Tanakh? They didn't know the prophecies. They didn't know the prophecies. They didn't know the word. So in ignorance, even though they are men of Israel, probably Jews, that looked really good. They probably, let's face it, they probably didn't know this. You know, when you go to the text uh, in Leviticus 4 and 5, don't go there, Kevin, but go to Numbers 15, verse 22, if you would, 22 through 31. Watch this, okay? If, if they knew this, and this is going to resonate, Numbers 15, verses 22 through 31, this is a scenario, right? The priest, it says this in verse 22, when you sin unintentionally, that would be the sin of ignorance, right? And do not obey all of these commands that the Lord spoke to Moses. All that the Lord has commanded you through Moses from the day the Lord issued the commands and onward throughout your generations. And if it was done unintentionally, without the community's awareness, the entire community is to prepare one young bull for a burnt offering because Rich accidentally stole something from Walmart. Like that's what, it, that's what we're talking about. Because somebody did something of ignorance. Somebody didn't mean to do this, right? This is the reality. I need you to put a burnt offering as a pleasing aroma to the Lord with its grain offering and a drink offering according to the regulation and one male goat as a sin offering. And then there's a lot more. The priest then makes atonement for the entire Israelite community so that they may be forgiven. For the sin was unintentional. All right, Kevin, I need you to scroll down just for the sake of time. Uh, can you go, I think, let me get there real quick. Uh, if you'll go to verse 30, Numbers 15, verse 30, but the person who acts defiantly, intentionally, right? That's what we're saying. Whether native or foreign resident, blasphemes the Lord, that person is to be cut off from his people. He will certainly be cut off because he has despised the Lord's word. Everybody hear that? And broken his command, his guilt remains on him. So you have two camps in the, in the men of Israel world, right? You have groups that are people that are sinning intentionally, people that are unintentionally. I think we do both of it, all of us. Would you agree? Maybe we're lying right now. No, I mean, I think we, at, we don't want to, but unintentionally and intentionally. Yeah, I don't know, maybe, right, kind of deal. I think this is important to understand because in verse 18, I'm back in Acts uh, 3. It says this, I, I know you did this in ignorance, just as your leaders did. It's almost like the message of repentance. It's almost like he's trying to give them a free pass. Like, guys, I know you're idiots. I'm going to help you with this. That's kind of what he's saying a little bit, right, Kevin? I mean, look, I know you did this. And by the way, this is the same language in Luke 23, verse 34. Look at this tie-in. Luke 23, verse 34. And what does Jesus say when he's dying? Luke 23, verse 34. It says, Jesus said, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. It's the same language. Peter says, you guys are ignorant. You just don't know the word. And by the way, your leaders didn't either. Because if you would have realized what Moses was saying, what Samuel was saying, what the prophets were saying, what the law was saying, by the way, you wouldn't be doing this. Jesus said the same thing on his death. Father, forgive them because they do not know what they're doing. And praise God, though, it doesn't just stay in judgment. Praise God, he sent the Holy Spirit through believers so that believers could give a message of hope and they don't have to stay in that place. Peter is conveying that message of hope. Just because you're functioning in ignorance doesn't mean you need to stay there. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. If, imagine, you guys, if this was our posture that we had every time and everywhere we went. They just don't understand. We've got to communicate the hope then. 
That makes sense? Maybe the kids in Chicago that were looting, hundreds of people that were running around, maybe they just have never heard. What if that really is the case? Then we have an obligation to communicate the message of repentance. Don't fault it on the ignorant ones. He's empowered us to deliver this message. And I think for me, uh, it was just a wake-up call. Kevin? I think it, it also puts, there's, there's a weight on the leaders. They're the know the word. Yeah. They're the communicate it. And there's no, no excuse for the leaders to be in ignorance. You know, in the Old Testament, if you did something wrong, you would go to a place called the city of refuge. Do you guys remember this in studies? You go to the city of refuge. It's interesting, Kevin, Hebrews 6, verse 18, if you'll go there. I, I just want to keep making this little bit of tie-in. I, there's so many things from the Old Testament that just keep pointing to him. And I really believe it's because of ignorance that we don't know. And by the way, I'm right there. I'm learning as we go. <laughs> so in Hebrews 6, 18, it says, so that through two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge. Why? Because we need help. Because we've done things from the past, we have fled for refuge, might have strong encouragement to seize the hope set before us. So the murderers that were placed in the city of refuge in the Old Testament, guess what? Jesus says, yeah, now that you're fleeing in refuge, you can come to me. It's almost too simple. It says in Hebrews 6, verse 19, we have this hope as an anchor for our lives, safe and secure. Interesting enough, the writer in Hebrews, it says it enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. You know, when you think about the the lame man, I want to just go there for a second if I can. The lame man was born lame, wasn't he? I, w- I want to write this down because I, I think this is important. Uh, and by the way, this comes, uh, Warren Wearsby is a, a great... Uh, theologian, and he just has three simple points, but I want us to see something. This, this man was born lame. And I think it's interesting, all of us, uh, when we were born, are unable to walk. All of us are unable to walk out as in order to please God. Adam fell, and then because of Adam's lameness, can I say it like that? Because of Adam's lameness, and Wearsby just says, his lameness was passed to all of our descendants. Every one of us were born with lameness. All of us were lame when we were born. And I think it's an incredible, unique picture that, guess what? We don't have to stay in that place. The lame man was also, I think you can also just say, he was poor. The lame man was poor. He's constantly at the gate. And as a result, you know, we are bankrupt before God. None of us can bring anything to God. The reality is is that we are unable to pay the debt that we owe him. This man that is sitting at the gate pleading for help. He was born lame. He had no money. And by the way, number three, this is really even more important. He was outside the temple. He couldn't get in. The lame man could not get in. He needed what? Help. All of us, you guys, are truly outside the gate. We don't have access to God unless we begin to understand ultimate healing means that we receive the gift and through Christ we now have access to him. We've gone from being lame and poor and outside the temple to now full access. And it comes through in Ephesians 2, it just says and it's totally free. There's nothing we can do to earn this or deserve this, but once we find who we are in Christ, the walking, the praising, and the leaping begins. And then everybody's in awe and amazement. Wow, by the way, Joel, he's a totally different person. By the way, our friends from Senegal, he's a totally different person because of Christ. Apostle Barbara in Botswana, you're a different person because Christ has taken you from outside the temple and he's taking you in. Like, I think for me, that's what we're after today. Peter and John grabbed this guy and because of a testimony from going from this to this, now he's saying to the ignorant, you know, have no longer any more reasons to question who this is. says in uh, Acts 3, 
He says in Acts 3, verse 18, but what God predicted through the mouth of all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer, he has fulfilled in this way. By the way, what, what Moses just said, everything, yeah, Jesus says, I came to fulfill it. Remember the road to Emmaus? Do you remember when he's talking to the two people and all of a sudden he says, this is me? Do you remember that conversation, that dialogue? I, I'm not going to do this because I don't think we have time. We don't have time. But I do want to just, I want to reference something for you guys. Um, I have over 25 points. Relax. I'm not going to write them. I'm not going to reference them. But I, I want you to know something about this. And by the way, we got a letter from a woman in a county jail in Waco this last week. They're doing Revive. This lady's doing Revive School. Revive School, when we teach Genesis through Revelation, it's now being put on through help of Kevin and Rich and Shelley and our team. It's now being put on uh, a tablets that inmates can have in all of the prisons. It started in Cofield where there's over 4,000 inmates, we started pouring into Joshua, one of those guys, pouring into these inmates. They now hopefully will really have access to watching Revive School, these lessons, Genesis to Revelation. And the whole point of Revive School is the point, where is the Messiah in every book of the Bible? And the question that this girl, this woman inmate had in Waco is, could you please send me all of the prophecies from the Old Testament about Christ? What? (laughs) An inmate in Waco is asking for the prophecies, and he says to the men of Israel, you guys are ignorant, you should know this and want this. He said, God predicted through the mouth, by the way, of all the prophets. Every prophet, he said, they were pointing to the Messiah. And in this process, you see this, you know, in in Isaiah, you Yeah, go there, Kevin, for a second. This one's applicable. Isaiah 35. Don't worry, I won't. You're like 25 points, dear Lord. Isaiah 35, verse 5 and 6. Just watch this one. This is a good one. I like this one. Isaiah 35. I love, there's nothing more fun when an Old Testament verse just ties straight to the New Testament. And you're like, yeah, how, how can they miss that? Because they're not reading this. Isaiah 35, verse 5, it says, Then the eyes of the blind will be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Keep going to verse 6. Then the, what? The lame will leap like a deer. (laughs) And the tongue of the mute will now sing for joy. For water will gush in the wilderness and streams in the desert. So all of a sudden, you're going to begin to see these things. Now watch in Matthew 11. Kevin, if you go there, Matthew 11, 2 through 6. (laughs) Do you guys remember when John the Baptist... Well, let me just go to Matthew 11, verse 2. I get excited about some of these texts. Matthew 11. Matthew 11. Hey, Bishop Andrew from Malawi. Good to see you, man. We got to keep bringing people in from outside the gate, especially in Malawi. Matthew 11. Kevin, if you'll go there. Matthew 11, verse 2. Matthew 11, verse 2. We're going to get there. Matthew 11, 2. Thanks, Kevin. When John, remember John the Baptist? And by the way, John the Baptist is, how is he related to Jesus? Do you remember? His cousin. So his cousin is in prison. And he sends a message by his own disciples, JB's disciples. And he says to ask Jesus, are you the one? Are you the one who's to come or should we expect somebody else? And Jesus' response is the best. He says, go and report to John what you hear, hear and you see. The blind see, the lame walk. Those with skin diseases are healed. The deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor are told the good news. And if anybody is not offended because of me, he's blessed. So all of a sudden, you have all of these prophecies. Remember, Peter is saying to the men of Israel, you guys are ignorant. You should know your own prophets. You don't even know what Isaiah is saying, what Jeremiah is saying. My prayer and my prayer for you is, Moses talks about this and so does Paul, that you would make the Jews so jealous that they become righteously angered that you know the word better than them. No, that's my word. No, no, no. Yeah, it is, but who you are in Christ should draw them because you're living out what they were told. And you see this. I'm not going to go there, but in Isaiah 40, the Messiah was going to be preceded by a forerunner, right? We see this in Isaiah 40. That Messiah was going to be a gentle redeemer of the Gentiles. That the Messiah was going to be despised and rejected. That the Messiah was going to set the captives free. The Messiah was going to be a, um, uh, (laughs) he was going to bring an end to sin. That Jerusalem was going to rejoice as the Messiah comes upon a donkey. You guys, there is so many prophecies. 
This is the second half of Matthew 4 that we just talked about last week. Matthew 4 talked about the prophecies. Jesus said, repent, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now Peter is saying, oh, by the way, you missed it. But maybe not. There's always hope in the message. And if you would, let's keep going back to Acts 3. Here's the hope. He says in Acts 3.18, but what God predicted through the mouth of all the prophets that his Messiah would suffer, he has fulfilled in this way. Therefore, repent and turn back. Because of your sins of ignorance, what he says is, is, man, by the way, it's not too late. And he says, what you can do right now is repent. Repent of your ignorance. Repent that you're like, sorry, God, I missed that. And then he says, by the way, and turn back. <laughs> now, I'm going to say something that's probably not too theological. I want him to say, in my mind when I read this, when it says repent, I think he wants to say, go back to your word. Turn back to the scriptures that you missed. I want you to turn back to the prophets. Turn back to all of the truth. I think that's, there's a little bit of that. Does that make sense? Go back to the source of life, the 39 books. Read them again and say, God, I'm sorry I missed this. <laughs> Repent and turn back to me. And he says, by the way, because you were ignorant, it's not too late. And then, man, it just, it just gets better. What you see in this text is it really just continues to build on this. And he just says, that the seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Kevin, when you hear seasons of refreshing, what, what, do, what do you think about? Like a nice hot shower? What do you think of? Pineapples? I think, I think of like a cool <laughs> spring in the middle of everywhere. It just... <laughs> Just gave you the Kev term. Maybe the beach. It's just peaceful. Okay, so you have a place that you go to. What is Peter talking about? What is he talking about? We're thinking about pineapples. We're thinking about peaceful place. But when he says that you can experience the refreshing presence from the Lord, what are we talking about here? Uh, presence of the Holy Spirit. Good. Rich, what do you got in the back? What do you think of when you hear of the seasons of refreshing? Yeah, I was going to say... Um the presence of the Holy Spirit just because of the scene where this is taking place is at the temple and the Lord's presence dwelled in the Holy of Holies which the veil had been torn so at this point um, they can be forgiven of their ignorance of not adhering to all 613 laws. Yeah, that's a lot of laws. By the way, one of the gentlemen that I asked that was Muslim, I just said, hey, how do you know that you're going to get into paradise? He said, well, I have, to li I have to adhere to all this list. And I said, I go, can you start listing them for me? He goes, well, I don't know them all. I go, well, then you're in trouble. Right? That's the reality. We have to realize we don't have to keep a list. It's, it's a gift. Now watch this. This is really, this is a unique verse. Kevin, go to Acts 11, verse 18. Write this down. Circle it in your Bible. This is one that I was like, huh, I wonder where that one's been all my life. Have you guys ever read that before? You're like, what? Did I never see that before? In Acts 11, verse 18, it says, when they had heard this, they became silent. Then they glorified God, saying, so God has granted repentance, resulting in life even to the Gentiles. So what are we talking about here? It's a gift. Repentance is a gift. God has granted repentance. He's giving the Jews an opportunity. He's giving them a gift. By the way, it's not too late, he says. Acts 11, verse 18 shows that it's a gift. When you go to Acts 20, verse 21, Kevin, here's another one I want us to circle I think this is important. When we think about repent and turn, right? When we're talking about repent and turn back so that your sins may be wiped out, like your sins will be forgiven. Acts 20, 21 says, I testified to both Jews and Greeks about repentance toward God and what do we turn to? And faith in our Lord Jesus. Repentance will always get us to turn to God and have faith in Christ, always. Repentance will always get us to turn to God and have faith in Christ. That's when the works worthy of repentance begin to come. Scripture just says, as Peter is telling the story in verse 19, as he's preaching right on the side of Chicago, this is the reality, I need you to repent. 
And he says, why? In verse 20, he says, and that he may send Jesus who has been appointed for you as the Messiah. Hang on here. Kevin, I thought Jesus already came. He did. So what coming is he talking about? He's talking about a second coming. Yeah, so what he just said, men, if you want to go from the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of heaven has come near to the kingdom of heaven has come now. If you repent, Jewish people, he's coming back. And now all of a sudden, we have what we just talked about, national repentance. When the Jews radically turn to the Lord in repentance, Peter prophesied right here, he will send Jesus who has been appointed for you. He just called for corporate national repentance. Understand that shift? And in Zechariah, watch this text, you guys, if you would. In Zechariah 12, verse 10, this is what it looks like when it happens. When genuine repentance, when it happens for the Jews, Zechariah 12, 10, we will see. Then I will pour out a spirit of grace and prayer on the house of David. And the residents of Jerusalem, they will look at me whom they pierced. They will realize, their eyes will now be open, their ears will now hear. They will now actually begin, Scripture says, they will mourn for him as one who mourns for only a child and weep bitterly for him as one weeps for a firstborn. They realize in their sins of ignorance what they missed. And you will see a national move of God through the Jews, which will cause the return of Christ. Everybody with me? In Acts 3, he just called for a corporate repentance to the Jews. And if you do, we will see him come back. What's one of the biggest reasons we have not seen the Messiah come back? The Jews haven't cried out to Jesus yet. And he says, I understand you're acting in ignorance. You just don't see your own word. These are not my words. These are the words of a fisherman, Peter, who's been radically changed. Kevin, you want to jump in? You got anything on this? I think it's, it's a, an interesting, you talked about why did we move Acts 3, this yeah. message. Like last week, you know, we looked at Jesus' message. It's, it's not a different message. It's just it's a different timing. That's right. And it's a different, different perspective of where the, we are in the timeline of the Messiah. Watch this. Can we go there? Uh, go to Romans 11, by the way. Romans 9, 10, and 11. Love those three chapters. That sounded weird when I said that, but go to Romans 11. Kevin, we're going to go a couple verses in Romans 11, verse 12. Here we go. Let's hang in here for a second. This will affirm what Peter was preaching at Solomon's colonnade at the porch, right? This is where we're at, which is at the Temple Mount, right? Just outside the temple. The temple is still there. Now it says, if they're stumbling, this is the Jews, if the men of Israel, if they're stumbling by saying no to Jesus, okay, that's what we're talking about, brings riches for the world. And their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full number bring? And what this means is, is because they have not said yes yet, because they have not repented yet corporately and individually, we can get into that, because of that, you and I have now had a chance to say yes to Jesus. And if that's the case, how much more will their full number bring? How much more will we now see the Jews eventually cry out to the Lord? Romans 11, verse 22. I'm going to just kind of keep going through three verses in Romans 11. Romans 11, verse 22, it says, therefore, here it is. Look at this. Consider God's kindness. Isn't that all of a sudden now you go to Romans 2, right? This language. Consider God's kindness and severity. Severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness toward you. If you remain in his kindness. What does God's kindness lead to, Kevin? Repentance. Otherwise, if you don't remain in his kindness, you too will be cut off. And in the Old Testament language, if you're cut off, you ain't coming back. If you hang out in God's kindness, it will lead to repentance. Finally, Romans 11, verse 26. Remember what Peter is saying is, I'm calling for a national corporate repentance. Do you see what the Word of God says? Romans eleven twenty six. 26. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the liberator will come from Zion. He will turn away godlessness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away 
their sins. Somebody, an amen? Why do I have such a heart for the Jews? Because I want to see him come back. Why do I want to live with passion and actually act like I have Christ in me? Because I want them to want what I have. That's what I want. I sent, I sent a, a rabbi, a, a Jewish rabbi, early, early, I was late last night. I sent him the video of Malawi. I had a guy from Jerusalem write me. I said, how's it going? I said, well, man, great. We're focusing on Malawi. And he goes, well, what's about Malawi? I go, repentance. And I'm like, I think I get a chance to live this out right now. And I think for me, um, we can call for individual repentance and corporate repentance. Let's go back to Acts 3 as we wrap all of this up, Kevin. Then Acts 3, it just says this in verse 20, right? So that he may send Jesus who has been appointed for you as the Messiah. Heaven must welcome him until the times of the restoration of all things. This is what we're talking about, okay? We have some of these components that the Gentiles are now going to hear. Jesus is where, by the way, right now? The right hand of the Father. I, I know sometimes these sound like an obvious question, but he's sitting at the right hand of the Father until all the times of the restoration, until these things take place, which God spoke about by the mouth of his holy prophets from the beginning. In other words, God's in charge. He knew they were going to say no, and he knew that we were going to say yes. And in verse 22, it says, Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers. You must listen to him in everything he will say to you. This comes straight out, by the way, of Deuteronomy 18. Moses is prophesying about the coming Messiah. He says this and in verse 23, and anyone who will not listen to that prophet will be completely cut off from the people. Deliberate. In verse 24, it says, in addition, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those after him have also, uh, have also announced these days. In other words, from Genesis to Malachi, what is taking place, Kevin? Over and over and over again. Tell them about the coming Messiah. Tell them about the coming Messiah. Isn't that crazy? You want to do the best study ever? Look at all the prophetic words we're sending right now. My daughter Maya sent this Waco inmate all of the prophecies of the Messiah from the Old Testament. And then, oh, by the way, here's in the New Testament. Here's what it looks like. That's one of the best studies you could ever do to get ready for Revelation. By the way, none of us have any fear, any reason to fear the book of Revelation. Why? Because if you are in the Old Testament, it pretty much gets you ready for the Revelation. I always say, when you're ready for the 66th book, it's because you've read the other ones. <laughs> Don't be these people of ignorance. And I think it's a, a reality that if we're not careful, the church in America and the church across the board, we're ignorant in what the Word of God says. And I'm not saying there are, there are not exemptions. There are people everywhere that study the Word. But corporately speaking, based on what I see, we don't know this Word. And I would just say, church, wake up. And maybe we need to repent from our time of ignoring what the Word of God actually says. He calls out the Jews. I think it's okay to say to the Gentiles, we need to wake up too. He says this in verse 25, you are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your ancestors, saying to Abraham, and all the families of the earth will be blessed through your offspring. <laughs> Everything's prophetic, by the way. God raised up his servant Jesus and sent him first to you, Romans 1.16, to the Jew first and then to the Gentiles. He raised up his servant Jesus, and here's his message. This is Jesus' message. He sent him first to you to bless you. God's kindness, right? This is what we're talking about. To give you what you need, and what do you need? He says, I'm asking you to turn away each one of you from your evil ways. Jesus came to bless the Jews so that they turn away from their evil ways. His message was repentance. Isn't that crazy? So now watch this. He went from a corporate preaching, Peter, to now individual. And I think for me, that's my heart for Malawi. Corporately, that the nation of Malawi would repent and turn to the Lord. But individually, in Malawi, my prayer is the same thing. And I'd say, God, please do that in America. Would you begin to show us our sins of ignorance? Or God, show us our deliberate sins. But either way, I believe when we repent and turn back to him, you and I will experience seasons of refreshing. How would I describe that personally? 
Seasons of refreshing, I think it's really easy. He means you get to sit down and you give everything to him. And then he just fills up your cup. You don't have to carry it anymore. You don't have to carry any of the things of I have to do this, I have to do this. No, man, you give everything to him. This is so interesting, I'm going to do this. <laughs> you know what's even better? I'm not, I hope I don't fall asleep. This is not an act, I promise. He gives you the comforter. The Holy Spirit will comfort you and refresh you. And I think we don't represent Jesus much because I think we just need to be refreshed. And the way you refresh is you repent and you turn to God and you experience your faith in Him. And then you can just sit in His presence. It truly feels good. <laughs> so, who doesn't want that? He wants it for his people, the Jews, and he wants it for the Gentiles. And if you want to understand repentance, this is really weird. That I'm, <laughs> if you want to understand his repentance, sit in his presence and spend time in the word. And it will always point you to the Messiah. Always. And so, Lord, I just pray. I pray for Acts 3 in our lives. I know this message is for the Jews. I get that. And I get that they're asking for a wake-up call to turn to the Word. But God, I, I really believe this is for all of us. All of us need to turn to you and repent of areas of ignorance we don't even know what we're doing, God, and sometimes we do know what we're doing, but when we repent and turn to you in Christ, we can get refreshed. And that just sounds really good right now. And so I pray that over every person online, every person online, every country that's represented, every chair that is filled in this room, God, I pray that all of us can experience his, his refreshing presence. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you and your comfort. And for those that don't have the Holy Spirit, the way you get the Holy Spirit is you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. That you recognize that we are the lame ones that are poor in spirit. We have nothing to offer. And yet when we receive this gift, we can go from the outside of the temple and into his presence. And so I pray, God, in this moment, maybe there's somebody that just needs to receive Christ first and foremost. And if that's the case, God, may they do that in this moment. It's never too late to turn to you. Thank you for your kindness, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks for coming this morning, this afternoon, this evening, for those that are online. And hey, guess what? We'll be back in a week, Lord willing. <laughs> Thanks for coming.